the night before the first day of battle the first sergeant came to me and said Whitaker get the men up at four we're going in I didn't sleep very well that night I don't think most of the men slept very well that night I got up at four the men were at the jump off point at five at six we were still waiting at seven we had not been called at eight the men are getting restless by eleven o'clock I looked down the meadow it was the woods on the left side but looking down the meadow there are about five I'm sorry, uh, eight to ten men were gathered just shooting the breeze. The thought flashed across my mind, interval. Soldiers, keep your interval. The purpose, of course, is to make sure that if artillery shell comes, it won't obliterate the entire group. I no sooner had that thought than I heard a whir. I knew exactly what it was. I hit the ground, and while I was on the ground, I marveled at how tall a blade of grass could be. <laughs> there was an explosion, and where those eight to ten men were was nothing but a hole. Now on the left of those men was a beautiful deciduous tree. But being December, it had lost all its leaves. But it was a beautifully balanced tree. And then, as I looked at it after the explosion, I thought, my God, what happened to that tree? That is an ugly tree. And I quickly realized it was festooned with little pieces of flesh and fabric of those eight to ten men. Those men are still missing in action. Today, those people would be identified. A small piece of flesh can be identified with the DNA of that of a particular person. It's just remarkable what they can do. But in Washington, D.C., we have the Tomb of the Unknowns. These are people that could not be identified and they are honored and protected every day and every night for the sacrifice that they have made for our country. Now, as we moved along, a light tank came back from the front. A light tank is so designed so that it has great speed can cover a lot of ground quickly and its purpose is to find the enemy main force so we could then engage the main force the discouraging part of a light tank is that a german 88 shell can go through one side of the tank and out the other side and there's not enough pressure to explode the shell kind of discouraging if you're a tank soldier. In addition, I noted we had 57 millimeter cannon anti-tank guns. They would bounce off German Tiger tanks. We had, our Sherman tanks had 75 millimeter cannon. German Panzers had 88 millimeter pan, uh, cannon. Things had to change. Now, we were 26 kilometers from Saarbrücken. We were uh, it, uh, moving well on the German West Wall. And then that night, we were ordered to attack this German position. We were a green division. We found out later we were up against 
a, an experienced German division. So we knew the moment that we took this hill that sometime during the night we would be counterattacked. So we sent out scouts across a 180 degree front to be sure that we would not be surprised. But probably around one or two o'clock in the morning, we were surprised. Later we found out that every one of those soldiers had been strangled with wire. They couldn't even utter a sound. And the Germans were on top of us bayoneting us and using burp guns. We call them burp guns because they, the sound was burp, burp, burp. And the battalion commander realized if he was going to save his men, he had to order artillery on our position. Every unit commander has a grid map of the area that he is in. He calls the firing officer. He reads off the letters. B-23, Z-15, T-12, and the firing officer repeats those back exactly. If they're not exactly, they do it over again until it is exact. Then second, seconds later, the shells start falling. Naturally, we lose some of our own men. But the Germans being above ground instead of in foxholes were driven off. Later, our division commander, General Kulin, who was a brigadier general, received his second star. And I believe it was General Patton who thought the division uh, uh, performed pretty well against the veteran German division. Now, shortly after that, the Germans had attacked through the Ardennes woods, which was very thick. No one thought they would go through the Ardennes woods because it's easy to get the, the cannon uh, barrels tangled up in trees. The only safe way to go through there would be with the cannon facing to the rear, which is not a good position to be in if you're running <laughs> into an enemy force. But General Patton had assumed that Hitler, being a uh, person who would take chances, he was going to do something. So he made sure that his army had the trucks necessary to move from his position up to help the first army. The thing that is significant about this battle is it is the largest land battle in American military history. 1.1 million men fighting to the death in over 40 days in December and January, from December 16 to January 25. The temperatures were between 30 and 40 degrees below zero. The casualties from the weather were just about as bad as the casualties from the Wehrmacht and the, and the Luftwaffe. It is so important to keep your feet dry. I had a pair of socks, dry socks, uh, under my helmet. I had a pair of socks that were damp and drying off across my stomach and a pair of socks on my feet. If your feet don't work, you're, you're really finished as an infantryman. There's a story about a soldier who was wounded along the line of fire. And he was crawling back to get out of that firing uh, atmosphere and he couldn't make any sound because he didn't want to draw attention to himself. He finally got back enough where a couple of men helped him and they had a stretcher. They put him on the stretcher and they carried him back but they continually fell down and at one point 
The lead bearer fell, the wounded man fell on top of him, and the rear bearer fell on top of both of them. They finally got back. The doctor looked at the wounded man. He said, son, you're going to be all right. We're going to get you back to your unit. There is nothing more important to an infantry soldier to hear the words, we're going to get you back to your unit because you're somebody in your unit. You're nobody in anybody else's unit, which means you're going to get all the crappy assignments if you go to somebody else's unit. Then the soldier, wounded soldier turned to the medic and he said, I owe my life to those men. I, I'd like to thank them. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, uh, we're sending them back to the United States. The soldier said, what? You're sending them back to the United States and I'm the one that's wounded? The doctor lowered his voice, got a little closer to the soldier and said, son, these men have trench foot. There is nothing we can do for them. We have to cut their legs off. That's how brutal the winter was. Now, the next thing that happened was the snow was so bad, the driving snow, which was coming from the west uh, from about you know, from about a 10 o'clock to a 4 o'clock, it was really a driving snowstorm. And uh, you, you couldn't even fight. Uh, but I found a little hut that the Belgians had used in 1940 when the Germans came through. And in this little hut with a pot-bellied stove, you were too hot on one side, and you were too cold on the back side. We had a mail call. I had two letters. One was from my sister and one was from my dad. I thought my dad's letter will be the most important. So I'll read the light letter from my sister first. The opening line of my sister's letter was, mother looked beautiful in the casket. I crushed that letter mashed it in my pocket, tore open my dad's letter, and he explained that the breast cancer that mother had had five years before, and we thought she would be all right because she had survived five years, had metastasized, and had taken her life on December 30. I was so hot. I couldn't stay in the hut. I had to get out of the hut. I walked into the snow storm, opened up my tunic, and let the snow and the wind hit my chest until I could get my body temperature down. That night, I slept on the ground with my back against another soldier, and I just wept quietly. But the saving grace of that moment was I couldn't see my family at that moment. And so I, I put it behind me, I put it in, in my subconscious because I had to stay alive, I had to do what an infantryman has to do. Then, I came across a tank, an American tank with a hatch open and a soldier laying on his, black, on his back with his eyes open. That's not a good sign. If a soldier's on his back, chances are he's dead. And so when you look at people in the eye, you wonder who they are. And I naturally wondered who this young man was. I opened up his tunic and I looked at his wallet. Here was a picture of his wife and himself and his two little girls. And the thought flashed through my mind, 
someone's going to know the meaning of real pain. That widow is going to get a telegram saying we regret to inform you that your husband died bravely somewhere in Belgium. Can you imagine the grief, the shock that woman has? She has lost her husband. She's lost the father of her two little girls. He'll never watch them graduate. They won't be able to enjoy that moment. You won't be able to walk them down the aisle when they're married. What is she going to do for income to survive and take care of these children? That's why my view has always been the real suffering of war is with the families. If somebody is walking up to a door that you don't know, is this someone bringing bad news? A telephone call from somebody you don't know, are they bringing bad news? If you see a couple of officers walking slowly up a, a sidewalk to the front door, you know what is happening then. In the little town of Iowa, the Sullivan family had five sons who, went, who served in the Navy. The oldest wrote the Secretary of the Navy and said, Sir, we would love to serve together. We're a great team together. We'll do the Navy proud. Uh, we respectfully request that you allow us to serve together in the Navy. The Secretary of the Navy was very impressed and he allowed them to do it even though there is a rule you can't have two people in the same family in the same unit. Then they were placed on a battleship in the Pacific a German submarine commander hit that battleship amidships where the ammunition blew up, the oil ignited, and men were blown into the sea. The oldest son swam frantically throughout the waters, wiping oil off the faces of the men. calling his son, his brother's names. He, he didn't, none of them ever answered. As he swam around, finally he was killed by a shark. Then one day, shortly after that, two naval officers walked slowly up the sidewalk, the front walk of the Sullivan House. The mother was at the door. She flung open the door and said, which one? And they said, all five. She collapsed unconscious on the door sill. What suffering that family had losing all five sons. President Roosevelt finding Hearing about that said, this family will go crazy unless we get them into the war effort. And they brought them into the war effort and they spoke at war bond drives where you could, and the people wrote checks. They, uh, they had, one of, had some of the biggest, most successful war bond drives they'd ever had. When people saw the sacrifice of that family they could do no less than contribute to the war effort. Now, the next thing that happened was the weather let up. And I looked, I looked east and I thought I saw a foxhole that was open. And so, 
I quickly got out of my foxhole, ran in a hunched position, and leapt. As I looked down, my God, there was a German in the foxhole. Would you believe me if I said I've never been more alert in my life before or since? You better believe it. I felt like I was in midair a long time. I was probably only in midair about two seconds. But everything in my being was going at warp speed. I felt I had plenty of time to look over the situation. My eyes were the keenest they've ever been. I could use some of that today. My hearing was the most acute it had ever been. I felt stronger than I had ever been. I leaped into that hole and choked the German soldier. But very quickly I realized he was frozen to death. That soldier had stayed at his post, even though it meant freezing to death, which is exactly what happened to him. Forty days in the snow of the Belgian Ardennes, with temperatures 30 and 40 degrees below zero, the coldest winter that it had in 30 years in Northern Europe. After, after the Ardennes came the Rhineland campaign. The Rhineland campaign consisted of crossing two fast flowing rivers, the Moselle and the Rhine. When we came to the Moselle, we looked across and uh, on the sort of a brick wall was a welcome from the German side which said, see Germany and die. Uh, we didn't think that was a very nice greeting. And I understand that later on, after we had crossed, some enterprising GIs had erased the conjunction and it just said, see Germany die. We thought this was a lot better sentence. And we came to the Rhine. Thank you. We came to the Rhine. It took a couple of days, maybe three days, to get all the supplies. The artillery had to move up. Uh, the medical units had to move up. The artillery had to move up. And the Germans didn't throw a single piece of artillery. No shelling of the west bank of the Rhine. They were waiting for us to get there and get in those buildings. Now, we had to cross the high ground on the west bank to get down to the uh, the line town, as they are called, the line towns along the line. And <clears throat> I was running across the field. And after a while, to get really good at understanding where the shells are going to land, either they're going to go over your head, or they're on one side or the other side, or they're going to be very close. I heard the whir of this shell, and I knew it was going to be very close. So I hit the ground, rolled up in a ball. The shell hit in front of me. It exploded, went up in a big V formation. Now, that was good. It went by me, went over my head. But you have a shock wave. The shockwave can, can kill you very easily. 
But there's something curious about the shock wave. It goes up and like a bell and comes down and then runs along the ground. If you're in the path of the shock wave, you're dead. But it turned out I was in the bell. It was pretty lucky. And then we finally get down to the town. And as I say, it took two or three days to get everything ready. I mean, the Army Air Corps had to be briefed on where we were, what we needed from them. Um, one of the things that is so tough for pilots is if they look down and they see soldiers on the ground, they all look the same. They're all dirty, grubby, they all have uniforms that are similar in color, either uh, sort of gray-green or, or brown-green. Even the helmets look almost the same from any height. And one of the things that sometimes helps, if you can put out panels that let the Air Corps know where you are and they, they should be shelling or strafing ahead of those panels. Well, the first thing that happens is that we stay inside the buildings. After dark, we come out and we file along till we get to a building where the hot food is and we have a hot meal. And then before dawn, the following day, we follow the same pattern again and we have a hot meal for breakfast, only two meals a day. Then everything is ready. And we want to go at night because we, it's, we're just ducks uh, on, on a, in a carnival. If, we're, if we go at daytime, they can see us so easily. So a shot was fired and everything starts. But what we didn't realize was that flares were being shot by the Germans and they come down very slowly and it makes the river look antiseptically white. I mean, it couldn't be any whiter if you were in a surgical room. That's how white uh, uh, it was. Now, you only send across a wave at a time. If you put everybody in the boats and send them across, well then uh, it's like shooting fish in the barrel. So after the war, I got a hold of our battalion commander, Colonel Robert B. Cobb, Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, I asked him what our losses were. He said we lost 80% in the first wave, 40% in the second wave, 20% on the third wave, in varying amounts in succeeding waves. Lost well, 80% of the, of the, uh, the communication group, the ones that have the radios that keep, that keep uh, control and direction for things. What did the Germans do? They took anti-aircraft guns, depressed them, blew up boats as they were trying to cross a swift flowing river. You cannot fire at the enemy on a boat. It's an unstable platform. And if you do that, you're spending more time out there, which makes you more vulnerable than if you just try to get across as fast as you can. Every boat has a destination point at the other side. It, that's your job to fight against the current and make sure you get at the, your destination point at the other side. Now, when you get some soldiers ashore, you can start firing back and they don't have the same free shots that they had before. The enemy was using um, tracer bullets so they could adjust their fire to make sure that they were hitting the targets they wanted. The adverse part of that is that we know where the bullets are coming from. 
And so uh, we can take a toll of those snipers. So we gradually get across and we come up to the um, shore. We're moving up uh, a, a vineyard to get up to the top. And by dawn, close to dawn, we're up near the top. And a group of German soldiers want to surrender. But other soldiers don't want to surrender. Now, we're at great risk trying to take surrendered soldiers if the others are not going to surrender. So we shot the surrendering troops. It had a salutary effect. The other troops began to pull back a little bit. And by dawn, we had taken the, the uh, hill. And the result? We're going to have to cut it, so you need to, we need to, you need to cut it. We're, we're, we're time. How, so, how much time I got? Like two minutes. Two minutes? Yep. OK. It's a short war, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, so now we received a Distinguished Unit Citation for that assault crossing. We had heavy losses, but we got the last most difficult uh, natural defense that the Germans had. It was all straightforward um, uh, to uh, across the rest of Germany. I'd just like to close with one little story about uh, Olschnitz was a town of 100,000. We had taken that town and uh, my buddy and I, Bill, decided to go into town. And so uh, we saw this soldier coming toward us and had a nice collection of fruit salad, all these decorations. And we, he knew exactly what we were thinking. He pulls out a little piece of paper. The paper, piece of paper said, this man is the chief of police of Olsnitz, and he is responsible for our safety. Do not interfere with his duties in any way. Sign, Lieutenant Colonel Robert B. Cobb. Oh, drat. You know, I don't, we don't mind if the chief doesn't like us, but if the colonel doesn't like us, we're in a whole heap of trouble. So what is that guy thinking? He's thinking that's a well-disciplined outfit. That officer's got control of his men. So we, we walk past the department stores and a body comes flying out through the display window, bounces on the sidewalk, rolls into the gutter, and a Russian displaced person comes out and in his broken English says, he's a bad man. We agree and walk on. Then we come to the square and I see this sign, photograph and I said, Bill, let's get our picture taken. He said, I don't know that we can do that. I'm thinking about my dad who had his picture taken in Paris in 1918. And my great grandfather who had his picture taken in Massachusetts as a lieutenant. And I thought, I'm going to top these guys. I'm going to get my picture taken by the enemy during the war. <laughs> so I go up, I knock on the door, no answer. I pound on the door, no answer. I take my rifle butt and crash it into the door. He comes down. He's sullen. He says he's closed. Now what do we do? We want him to take our picture, but he doesn't want to take our picture. How do we handle that? Well, we decided to smile. We smile and we said, you're open. And he's looking at two riflemen with restless guns. And he decides discretion is the better part of valor. So he takes our picture, but he's got a tripod with a giant box uh, a camera on top and a heavy black leather uh, cover over his head. We don't know what he's doing. So Bill levels his rifle at this photograph in Meister's head and I'm trying to look nice, but I'm also looking very serious as if to say one bad move and you're one dead crowd. <laughs> and so we got that picture I come home, I show my dad this picture. He's not impressed. He's a very competitive guy. He's not, he's not gonna be 
edged by his son doing something like that. At any rate, uh, the war ended satisfactorily, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.